Good afternoon and welcome or welcome back to our weekly pop-up exhibition series. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome to the series uh, Professor, I call you Tomek. It would be Tomasz Konsevitz, but it's Tomek. We have become friends almost instantly uh, during his, uh, his visit. Uh, uh, at Berkeley, he's a Fulbright visiting professor at the Berkeley Law School, professor of European and Comparative Law, and the director of the Department of European and Comparative Law at the University of Dax in Poland. Uh, Tomek has worked extensively on the topic of, of restitution of cultural assets, and this is what he's talking about today. Uh, the rules of the, of the game, so the rules of engagement for our weekly pop-up exhibitions is that we put uh, presenters, academics, uh, speakers from the community, people who are coming through Berkeley and sometimes we manage to staff them and, and, and bring them in here, in conversation, even if the conversation is not exactly direct, but in conversation with objects from the Magnus Collection, Magnus Collection, 15,000 objects from all over the world, uh, painting histories of the global diaspora, and today's conversation is with a series of artifacts that were brought to Berkeley in a, during a very special window of time in 1968, in the summer of 1968, a young man from Berkeley who incidentally became a lawyer as a practice as a, practice as a lawyer in New York City today, uh, John David Bafra, traveled to his ancestral home in uh, what was then Czechoslovakia right after the, the Prague Spring and also traveled to uh, the site of, a, of an extent, a vanished community, a community that vanished in the, in the Holocaust, the Toski Mikulash, and brought back into it. So it was a time in which this was possible. And of course, the legal implications of all this are yet to be explored in today's uh, world. But brought to Berkeley objects from this community that represented the history of this family. And so we have some artifacts here, including uh, a seating chart for a synagogue. This was actually essentially a fundraising tool. They were, they were trying at the time to build a new expanded synagogue, so they were allocating seats to the various community members saying, this is where you will sit. And as with the Allen would have, would have said, you know, closer to God or <laughs> more, you know, further away from God. But uh, there, it was actually two, there we have two charts, one for the male section of the synagogue, one for the female section. And these are actually a, a very interesting con contraption to uh, make offers to, to, to contribute money uh, to, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you for money. Uh, that was not the plan, but to, to contribute money to, to the congregation. Um, this came, this material came along with books, manuscripts, and objects of various kinds, including textiles, synagogue textiles, etc. And today represents the heritage of the community that doesn't exist anymore. There is nothing but this that documents that, that history. And many of these stories are represented in our collections throughout the history of the madness, various, as they were called in the 1970s or 80s, rescue missions to places where Jews no longer live, were organized so uh, folks from Berkeley would travel across the world and bring artifacts back to, uh, to, to California to be included in this collection. Uh, a lot of materials from India came in this way, from Morocco, and of course, of course Eastern Europe. Uh, through these materials, we're able to, many of these objects are now digitized online. You can, you can look up this uh, sort of unusual name of Bintoski Mikulash, part Slovak, part Hungarian, on that border. Uh, of transitional identity. So this is how we, we do research and we document history. But today's topic is tangentially connected with this in terms of what do we do with cultural objects, who they belong to. And, and this is a very present topic. It's hitting us in all sorts of ways, books, Hollywood, um, the restitution of cultural property, and, and comics involvement has been direct, passionate, and also very political. So we're very much looking forward to, to uh, exploring the various elements of, of his work. And it's also a success story that you're presenting. So that's, uh, that's also good. And there are many of these stories that are not successful, or there are stories that end, that finish at some point. It's, it's wonderful to hear about a story that continues and, that, and, and a legacy that continues to, 
to live on. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Tomasz Kontrewicz to the Madness at your Francesca and thank you, thank you uh, to everyone who was here. Uh, uh, I want to uh, start my, uh, my presentation, my talk with uh, some qualifications. Uh, first of all, I don't want you uh, to look at me as a lawyer today. I want to look at me as a human being first and then lawyer. So the final, I know it's not easy, I know it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, the final part of my, of my talk will be lawyerish. Okay, uh, first two parts will be about the uh, person, about the poet who was caught in between the uh, two totalitarian regimes, who suffered, who lost everything. And uh, most crucially, when I started about the case, uh, and the case started to drop on me, I realized that this person was never defeated, he was never broken. It might have seemed that he was broken when he died in 71. But he was never he was never defeated by the system, because in the last words uh, that he sent to his daughters from the uh, Polish prison in '62, uh, on the expectation that he would be deported to to the Soviet Republic, that would mean death. Basically, uh, he was still full of optimism. He he said. Uh, be a good person. Your father was always caring about the people. Uh, he made some mistakes. He, he, he realized he made mistakes. But he always believed in what he was doing. The power of poetry in an unfree society. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the first point that's really, that's really uh, worth uh, uh, bearing in mind. Uh, secondly, I want you to uh, remember about three networks. Three nevers that really informed my involvement in this case, and uh, trust me, at times it was never it was it was not easy because you know for six years I was pushed back and forth from one ministry to another, from one court to another, uh, and you know there were times when I was really losing faith that uh, that in the end we might we might prevail. So three nevers are the following. Never business as usual, and this I heard a lot. Don't don't touch things as they are. They are okay. Do not look into the past. The past should be left to the historians. So business as usual was this. Uh, it should be where it is. It's not for legal uh, analysts, legal lawyers to s start, you know, meddling with the past. So business as usual was, was rejected uh, in the first place. Never accept that something can't be done. And this I heard a lot too. That can't be done. Why that can't be done? If you have passion, if you have uh, legal tools, if you, can, if you can put some heart into what you are doing, well, the sky, the sky is the limit. Reaching the sky takes years sometimes, as in this case. But it, it was work. The journey was work. And finally, uh, do not the limitations of others become your own limitations. And this one I heard a lot too. People who were on the other side of the fence, they were always telling me, this case cannot be reopened. But this was their world, and their world was full of question marks and full of limitations. I just wanted to explore what happens if you try, if you if you if you if you do something to reopen the task. And on the way, I found some uh, fantastic, some fantastic uh, uh, things. Uh, I learned a lot about myself. I learned about a lot about the uh, Polish legal system. I learned a lot about the Polish judiciary. And after this case, and after a couple of publications uh, uh, in Polish, uh, Polish legal press that I wrote, I was called the enfant terrible of the Polish legal system by the judges. Because I was coming back, I was pushing relentlessly. Uh, and I never quit. And there's one more important, uh, important aspect of this case that I really want to share with you. Uh, I call this uh, magical symbolism. This case was 
full of magical symbolism. From, from, from the very moment I met Ina and, uh, 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 and her sister in New York, to the very end of, uh, of, of this case. What are the, ma the, 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 the magical elements of this case? Well, think about it. Uh, this is 2010, I am in New York. Uh, my mom's friend from high school in Wrocław, my hometown in, uh, in Poland, uh, invited me to the United States. I'm on my visit to New York. And Ina Lansman, the daughter of uh, Naftali Herzkan, she's organizing a uh, send-off party for her, for her sister, who is uh, who's, uh, visiting her from Tel Aviv. So Dorota, my mom's friend, asked Ina, could I bring uh, my, my friend from Poland? And Ina said, yes, of course. And I went to the party, and at the end of the party, uh, Ina took me to side and asked me whether I would be uh, kind enough to have a look at her father's case because she's been trying in vain for the last six years to locate the uh, poetry, poems, letters that were confiscated by the communist regime in the uh, 60s. Uh, she found copies in the court case file, but uh, what happened to the originals? Nobody knew. And she realized that she would need the lawyer. But for her, it was a very difficult decision. It was not just a case. It was the history of uh, her family. And you know, in a way, he ha she had to share the story with me because I had, I had to know everything. So, uh, so we, met, we met like that. And for me, I was unaware that uh, a journey that will be transformative, that was transformative, has just started. Okay? So final, uh, final, uh, final qualification. This case is not so much about legal arguments. That was my starting point when I took on the case. It was all about moral aspects. How to translate? How to translate moral arguments into law? And how the law should respond to history, to the past? And when I brought the moral argument in front of the uh, Polish courts, trust me, many, many, many Polish courts, they were taken by surprise. They didn't know what to do. Uh, and you know, they did everything within their power to sweep the case under the carpet, rather than trying to, to solve it, rather than trying to see the, the person behind the, the, the files the person whose uh, life was uh, full of uh, tragedy, disappointment, disillusionment. They never looked at this case from this, this perspective. And that was one of the uh, greatest uh, disappointments for me. Because when I, came, uh, when I came back to Warsaw after meeting Lina, Ina, uh, I contacted the uh, original court in, uh, in Warsaw that sentenced Naftali Herzog in uh, uh, 62. And I asked, what happened to the uh, literary state that was part of the evidence in this case, but which was never returned to the rightful owners. And the president of the court took one month and a half to, to answer me, and she said that the literary state has been disposed of by sending this to the archives in Warsaw. And this is where true disappointment so I'm writing a letter to the uh, archives in Warsaw, and they are absolutely perplexed. No answer. They are stonewalling. I'm calling them. Nothing happens. So finally, I go to Warsaw, and I ask the guy, "Can you look up your your stuff and tell me whether there is something resembling files?" belonging to Naftali Herzkan that formed part of this case in Warsaw. He had a look, and he said, it looks like we have something like that. At that time, we never had any idea whether the materials, the, the poetry, had survived. Because it was very common for the outgoing communist regime in 1989 to destroy uh, all kinds of uh, uh, documents in order to uh, to make it more difficult for the victims uh, in the future to, to 
claim by the property to hide crimes sometimes. So I, I didn't even know where to look, where, whether it was still there. And when he said, yes, we have something resembling what you're looking for, but it's in a tiny village near Warsaw in our branch. So I took the train, I went to Milanovek, which is uh, 20, 20 kilometers uh, north of Warsaw. And then, trust me, they were shocked. Because the lady had the look, and she brought 15, 15 files of uh, Yiddish letters, Yiddish files, uh, short novels, that's been there for 45 years, gathering dust. And why, why it is so important? Because the fact that they were unaware of the fact of, of, of the storage uh, showed later the cynicism of the argument of the archives in not returning uh, the uh, literary state. Because they argue it is so important for the cultural heritage of Poland that we cannot give it back to you. We could provide you with the copies, but the originals must remain where they are. Hey, come on, what kind of argument is this if you didn't even know for 45 years that it's been there? So, uh, this is how it all started. All right? Before I go, uh, before I go uh, to the uh, legal aspects, uh, let, me, let me show you uh, a few photos of uh, Naftali Herzkon. Uh, he was born in 1910 uh, in the Habsburg Empire, in the uh, Star which is close to Chernobyl, which was the capital of Bukovina. And his life was full of uh, dreams, uh, disappointments, uh, but also very strong belief in what he was, uh, what he was, uh, what he was doing. He's uh, here. This is early, early twenties. That's the literary group of uh, local poets in Trinos. Uh, and look at his face, because then in a second you will see how his face evolved over time as he's been getting all those blows from all angles. Communists, from Soviets, from uh, KGB, from Polish uh, uh, security authorities. He's here. Still 20s. This is early 30s in Warsaw. Because he, he moved to Warsaw uh, in 32 or 33, and uh, uh, he started uh, uh, publishing. Uh, and he, he became quite famous in the literary circles of the Yiddish uh, writing community in Warsaw. That's, uh, that's uh, the poet with, uh, with his wife in Warsaw. That's the photograph taken, again, with the question mark, around uh, 38, 39, because in 38 he was uh, uh, sent to Gulag, the labor camp, he was sentenced to four years of Gulag, and Gulag is the, was the hell on earth. That was the first time he was sent. Look, look how his face has changed. This is, for, this is 48. This is 48. The picture was taken by the KGB when he was sentenced to death and sent to Gulag. It was then commuted 25, 25 years of uh, imprisonment in Gulag. And I spoke to Ina, because she sent me this photograph, because I, wanted, I really wanted to show you this one. He was never aware of the fact that this picture was taken. He never saw this photograph. So uh, she managed to recover this photograph from the archives in, the, uh, in Ukraine. And she told me that every time she sees his face, uh, She's uh, having a very difficult, difficult time to order. This is uh, this is fifties uh, in Warsaw again. This, uh, when he was released from uh, Gulag after being rehabilitated, his family moved back to Warsaw for the second stint in Warsaw. This is Warsaw. 
And in 62, in 62, he was sentenced uh, to prison for subversive writing, released after serving a, a sentence. And uh, in the 60s, after, after he was released, uh, he went to Israel, and he died in Israel in 71. And what is important, his literary state, the poems, the, 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 the writing, short stories, letters, were never returned to him. Although, the law as it stood at that time entitled him and his family to claim it back because those letters, those poems, were not connected to the crime that he was found guilty of. Okay. So it was another example of uh, political persecution. And you know, I'm a writer, I write a lot, so I, I cannot imagine somebody coming into my house and taking my library, my books, it would be like ripping my heart out. And his heart was ripped out by the security regime. And he lamented the fact that even though the judge should have returned the writings, he never, he never did it. So when, when he died in 71, the, the, the silence fell on his story for 45 years, until, until uh, 20, 2010, when we met, when we met in, uh, in New York. So, you know, the, uh, already that I managed to locate his, uh, his literary state, that the archives were not interested in uh, cooperating in returning, that there was a clash of narratives. Myself uh, arguing in favor of uh, restitution, uh, rule of law, uh, right to property, uh, EU law as binding on, uh, on Poland, and the state authorities uh, replied back, it must stay where it is because it's part of Polish cultural heritage. And I couldn't accept this kind of argument. I got angry. So with the archives in denial, I started to think what kind of legal strategy I should uh, adopt to claim it back. Because the case that seemed to be pretty easy on its face, they should have returned what's not theirs, turned out to be a legal quagmire that lasted six, six years. So the strategy was very, very simple. Write a letter, letter, a pleading to the court in, in Warsaw, and ask the court, the court to order the archives to return the literary state. What a huge disappointment the first decision of the court in Warsaw was. The court in Warsaw passed the bat and took cover under the 62 decision. It said that what's done is done and cannot be undone. So I appealed to the court of appeal in Warsaw. And the court of appeal in Warsaw sent a mixed signal. Very important for the family and for, for the future of this litigation. It said that the ownership of the literary state had never been passed to the state. So the state is not the owner of the uh, literary state, it's just the repository. But the court of appeal, court of appeal is not competent to order the return because it is the archives who are the repositories. Of, uh, of the literary state, and as a result, I should address myself to the archives. And this is exactly where the hard part started. Because with the archives, the fight was a, it, it was a dog fight. I was writing a formal uh, pleading, asking, please do return, coming up with those moral arguments, legal arguments. And the director of the state archives, and this is something that really infuriated me, he replied with private letters. We cannot do that. And he was very aware of why he was doing that. Because by writing a letter to me, he made sure that there was no legal redress, because you cannot go to court and question the private letter. So. Uh, it took two years of this kind of correspondence. I went all the way to the Prime Minister, Minister of Culture, and it was always the same. It can be done. It can be done. It's business as usual. So, you know, I was uh, having a very hard time. Because at that time, I thought, 
wow, maybe I should accept that kind of narrative. It can be done. Let the past be, be past. And then the Eureka moment came in, uh, in March 2012. I remember I was uh, sitting on the bus waiting for my plane to uh, brought up to my parents for Easter. And then I realized that there's one more avenue, uh, legal, legal avenue that should be, uh, should be used to, to apply to the Supreme Court, Poland, who, who was the final uh, decision maker in this case in uh, 62, and ask the court to rectify the order that should have been taken in 62, ordering the uh, return of the literary state. Because that was the law at that time, and that, that is the law in Poland right now. And then there was a first glimmer of hope in this case. The Supreme Court heard my case uh, after two months, and it said the following. Yes, you are right. The court in the past should have ruled on the literary estate as part of the case file. It did not do that. So it is, it should be left to the regional court in Warsaw that sentenced Naftali Herzkon at first instance in 62 to, to try to come to terms with this, this, this inaction and decide whether I am right or wrong. So you can see that after three years, I came a full circle. I started in the regional court uh, in Warsaw, and then after three years, the Supreme Court sent me back to the regional court, but this one with one huge difference. It ordered the court to consider ex expressly my demand for return and my argument that it's, it's the court's fault in the past that the literary estate was not returned to the rightful owners. And in uh, October 2012, it happened. There was a hearing in the regional court uh, in Warsaw, and the court said yes. Finally, they read what I was writing for the last uh, three years. They said that it should have been returned in the past. It was the court's mistake not to do that. So, the owners have a good argument in, in claiming all this back. So, eight, six months later, there was a, a formal, formal uh, archives meeting in March, in Warsaw, March uh, 2013 in, in Warsaw, where the uh, director of the archives, my enemy, uh, so many, so many years. I finally saw the face of, 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 of this guy writing me letters, and you can't imagine how s satisfied I was at that time. You know, sitting at the table, and the guy was standing in front of me, reading aloud the order of the court, enumerating the poets and uh, the letters that are to be returned. I will show you uh, pictures in, in a moment from, 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 from this event. And you know, that was the most gratifying moment of all. Because uh, it can be done, after all. It's not business as usual. So, you can ask me where all this perseverance came from on my part. And this is the second uh, magical aspect of this case. Uh, this case uh, coincided with uh, uh, the death of my uh, grandmother, and uh, she was recognized uh, just a year ago posthumously as the righteous among the nations of the world. Uh, she saved Jews during the war, and uh, <coughs> it's still blue bumps, I, I feel. Uh, and I stayed uh, my, a lot of time during my law studies uh, with her, and uh, she gave me some wonderful lessons. Uh, how to be a good man, how to never take no for an answer, how to stand up, how to keep pushing. And you know, it's uh, in a way, this case is a legacy and it's a tribute to my, my, my grandmother. Uh, so uh, I started with, uh, with uh, uh, telling you that this case was a journey that transformed me, and it transformed me not as a lawyer, as a human being, that it can be done. It's not business as usual. That dignity, property rights,
stand for something after all. It is not just the constitutional text that you have to modify in order for the state to qualify as the state ruled by, by law. It's how the judges, it's how the, the real people operate on the basis of the text. Poland is a, is a good country. We have a wonderful constitution, but we have a problem with the application of the law that is there. So it's sometimes like invisible mental walls that you have to break through. The text is okay, but it's, it's time to apply to enforce the text as, as it is. All right? And this is something uh, that brings me back to the uh, title of uh, my presentation, Piercing the Veil of Silence. What silence? Not silence of the law. Silence of those who are supposed to apply the law. Silence of those who owe something to the people coming to the court. Courts today are not just mouthpiece of the legislature, black or white. No, they, 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 they are supposed to uh, give me a fair trial. They are supposed to uh, listen to my arguments. Uh, I have my own expectations coming to the court. And this is something that must change in order for the restitution to get off the ground. You know, we can, we can change text, we can uh, modify constitutions on and on and on. But without the actual application, it's uh, just paper. Uh, it means nothing. And that was uh, the most infuriating experience for me. With all those high ground moral arguments that I uh, kept coming back to, to the courts, nobody listened to me. I was like a crusader, troublemaker. And I didn't like that. Because that's not the country I want to live in. And it really means something to have a just system. So piercing the veil of silence tells you another story. What is the role of the law? The law can help you remember and can, can help you forget. And you know, in Eastern Europe, it's the other way around. We think that the law should either help you forget or remember. No, it's not either or. It's remember and forget. And let's find the right let, let's find the right balance. You know, the, 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 the legal world is great. It's not black or white. It used to be black or white. The mechanical jurisprudence of judges simply repeating what the legislature said, it belongs to the past. And yet we do not accept that in history. Judges are seen as a functioner responsible for imposing the will of the state on the people. They are not to protect individual rights. And that was the reason why it took so long to break those walls. Because when judges saw me coming to the court on behalf of the daughters of the poet, they wanted to apply the law as a sword to punish, <coughs> which was very typical for the communist <coughs> Law is an instrument to make sure that we are on the way to a classless society, happy and uh, prosper. Hey, in 89, times have changed. I look at the law as a shield. And you are my shield, judge. You are to protect me against the state. Okay? So with the restitution cases uh, right now, you have this major, major problem. That on the one hand, uh, individual no longer lives in the shadow of the state. It's a partner to the state. It should be like that. And on the other hand, on the other hand, you have those listless uh, authorities applying the law and how to make sure that the mental change comes and make sure that the rule of law is more than just a paper. We no longer live in the shadow of the state, but we still live in the shadow of history in history. And as Norman Davis, the famous historian, said, history is a welcome, sometimes unwelcome, guest at each Pole's dinner table. And there's no 
hiding. There is no pretending that the past did not happen. The past happened. Something terrible happened and let us translate the past into the future using the law. You know, there is this term of uh, transitional justice. Justice that uh, tries to make a reasonable compromise between remembering and forgetting. Because you cannot call into question the past endlessly. There must be a stop to this process at some point. But on the other hand, some wrongdoings must be addressed. We cannot pretend that they did not happen. The compromise is very, very difficult to achieve, but it is possible. It can be done. It can be, it can be done. So, let me show you. So this is the moment uh, of uh, victory and satisfaction in the archives in Warsaw in March 2000. 13. Uh, this is Ina Lanzmann, one of the uh, poet's daughter. There was, there was a, a press and radio at the event, so she, she's been showing uh, uh, all the materials. This was the first time that she saw the originals. I was the first one in a few year, uh, years back who saw those files. But after that, I was denied the access because they knew already that something's growing. So, a uh, huge, huge uh, uh, moment and very, very gratifying. This is Bitan, the, the second owner. And why we are so, uh, why we are so uh, focused on studying those documents? Because, from my experience, I just wanted to make sure that they are giving back what they are supposed to give back. You know, with the archives and with the director of the archives, you never know, after three years, of uh, the fight, I didn't trust this guy. So uh, we had a, a person, a very close friend of, uh, of, of the family, who spoke Yiddish, who made sure that they are giving back what they are supposed to give back. Counting pages, that was important as well. This is the final Okay, and uh, let me uh, let me let me you know I I I plan all this uh, differently, but you know uh, where the emotions come into play, you, you can plan too much. Let me just uh, read uh, one paragraph from my argument that really encapsulated the reasoning that was behind uh, all this. That's from the appeal. The daughters of the men whose life had been destroyed by the regime were denied elementary justice by the Warsaw Regional Court's refusal to return to their father's writings. The fruit of his creative endeavors and the meaning of his life. Only their immediate return after nearly 50 years of illegal seizure can restore justice and lend substance to the constitutional right to property. That was something that was completely misunderstood. Argument from the Constitution, argument from constitutional rights, argument from the judge's duty to protect our constitutional rights didn't count. So that was the most frustrating part of, uh, of this case. You've been writing, 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 and nobody listened to you. So you can understand uh, how great I felt listening to uh, Mr. Director, reading aloud, final reading aloud. Yes, the archives are supposed to uh, return it. Not by way of letters. Handing over. So it was a uh, great, great moment of uh, satisfaction. And one more, uh, one, more, one more thing that I uh, really want to uh, read out to you. That's, uh, that's the fact, I mean, he, he thought that that would be his final letter to, the, to, to his family. In, uh, in 61, when he was waiting for the uh, uh, for his case to be decided by by the regional court in Warsaw, and he said he, he wrote he wrote this and please listen. I am absolutely innocent. I never committed any crime against anyone. Perhaps I made mistakes, but as a human being, I have not erred. 
I wrote purely that which my heart and my conscience has dictated, and my motto in life was truth and once again truth, and to do good for people. Perhaps I should have been born one century later. Forgive me, my loved ones. I decided that this is not a decision of a deserter, but a decision of a human being for whom freedom and life are one and the same. And then, by way of a postscript, he adds this. I'm writing to you from the prison where I sat in, where I sat in 1932 as a revolutionary writer. Now the circle is closed. Every person has his circle. I have reached the end of mine. So, uh, for me, I thought that this was the end of uh, my circle uh, in March 2013. That was not. Because we just got uh, what was the most important for the family, the literary state. But what about those decisions from the past that convicted him, uh, Naftali Herzog in the first place? So it took me uh, almost three more years to make sure that those decisions from the past were quashed. And last June, on 26th of June 2015, an uh, extended composition of the Supreme Court of Poland, uh, seven, seven, seven person chamber, uh, acquitted Naftali Herzkong. And that was the only moment, and this is very personal, that was the only moment uh, when I was uh, on the brink of uh, uh, breaking down and crying. And you know why? Because after all those seven years, the memories of being pushed away, uh, not being taken seriously, it was like a flashback. It all came at that very, at that very uh, moment. And I felt, oh my God, this is the closure. This is the end of the road. This is the end station. So uh, this, uh, this, 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 this case really, really transformed me. Uh, it, it added a wonderful friend, uh, Ina and Vita. Uh, I know that I've changed their life too. Uh, Ina is, uh, right now, she's working on the translation of, uh, of uh, his father's work. Uh, once translated into English, uh, she plans to donate the Yiddish originals to the Evo Institute in New York so that everybody uh, can, uh, can, can read. And his poetry is absolutely, absolutely stunning. And it's sadness, because it's very sad, but it's very beautiful. And uh, let, me, let me finish my, 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 my talk by reading one, one of his poems that was really uh, an inspiration for me uh, during, this, uh, during this case. It's, uh, it's contained in the uh, collection of poems uh, called Written from Memories because uh, Naftali Hertz Khan had a, had a unique way of composing his poems in gulags. He never tried, he never stopped writing, excuse me, in gulags. Uh, he used a toothpaste on the makeshift table of uh, table of class with a mixture of uh, 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 water and a cigarette. He wrote the poems, memorized the poems, and wiped the tablet clean. And when he left for Israel uh, in the 60s, he wrote all those poems, and they were published. And uh, the title of uh, the collection uh, in Yiddish is Farshiv in Tzikor, written down in memory. He memorized those poems and then wrote them down. And I want to read you one of my favorite, called Written Down in Memory. Okay. Did they think, if they confine my space, I will be a branch cut off from the tree? Did they think? If they lock me up in prison, I will fade, wither, that I will grow moldy, rot, <coughs> for the spirit to be free. There is no fence. In my cell, in the cage, I, also a branch, a tree, the earth, nourished my roots from my own force, from my own juice, 
destroy my spirit, it lives, weaves, creates, does not stop writing. On the hands I will rings, but I do not stop singing. There is no pencil, no paper. My poems, written in my brain, in its depth, they slept or stumbled, dogged on the sleeping stone of conscience. And that's the most powerful expression of uh, why this person has been an inspiration for me. Never give up on your dreams. Do what you love to. Explain to people why writing is important against all odds. Uh, leave your own trace for the posterity. So I'm very thankful for uh, 2010, for meeting uh, Ina and Vita, because uh, as much as I transform their life, they transform mine. And you know, after the case was uh, finally uh, finished, I felt sad, because it, it filled my life. It really was growing on me for many, many years. So one, why, once it was gone, I asked, wow, what should I do now? So I wrote a book, and uh, one of the chapters of the book, uh, the, the, the Polish title of the book is uh, Law of the Human Face. And one of the chapters uh, is on the future, present, and past of the Polish judiciary. And I've uh, been drawing explicitly on the, my experience in, uh, in this case. So, uh, hello, I'm the enfant terrible of the Polish judicial system. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 one more thing. Uh, I, I asked... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I would like to uh, to to, to uh, read one more one more point that was chosen for this uh, presentation by Ina Lansman. Okay, so uh, so thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. And uh, please forgive me if uh, the presentation or my talk has been a little bit uh, emotional, but uh, that's why I want. You can't divorce love from emotions. You have to put your heart in what you are doing, and that's what, that's why we want. So thank you very much. reading the uh, decisions, uh, the orders uh, made by the court, and all of a sudden, one of the witnesses' name was Hershkovich. And I called my mom, and I asked, Mom, Hershkovich 
is it the Julius name and uh, uh, the family name? And Julius, her daughter, is a high school friend of my mom. She she's been living in San Francisco for many years. And it turned out that Mr. Hershkovich, who was called to the witness stand in Naftali Hershkov's criminal case, was the husband of uh, Ms. Ruzha uh, Hershkovich. So. Uh, you can understand why this case was so, so symbolic and so important. I kept discovering unexpected things in those, uh, those files. And you know, the most important thing, we gave back Naftali Herzkon his face, his dignity. His work will be remembered always. That's what comes in the end. Thanks. thinking of, of um, exactly why the bureaucrats and the judges stonewalled you for so long. And when you think back to, to other cases like the Klimt painting and Woman in Gold, there the Austrian state had an interest in keeping something that it viewed as a cultural treasure that was on public display. And if you think of uh, Simon Goodman's book called The Orpheus Clock, in which he chronicles 20 years of trying to get back his family's art from various museums and private collectors around the world. It's obvious what their motivations were. Uh, in this case, the current regime has no ideological incentive to defend the old regime. And so it's not understandable why they would defend actions that were done in 1962 when this is the post-communist era. One possibility is anti-Semitism is a point of continuity? Uh, or is this just the story of bureaucrats who view any change or any challenge as a threat to either their egos or their authority? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. And you know, that's, that's the question I've been asking myself for uh, six years. What's behind this stubborn refusal? And. Uh, the answer might be more prosaic than you might think. Uh, laziness of the judges. They never read, they never looked at my arguments. With the archives, it would be different, I, I, I would say. Because uh, the director of the archives realized pretty quickly how important for the future the decision might be to return the literary state of a Jewish poet convicted in communist regime, because it's 99%, I'm sure of that, that there are more, more skeletons in the closet, in the archives closet. But you know, people are old, uh, they don't want to reopen the past, uh, so they just quit. But I'm sure that the director of the archives realized that it might be a huge, huge precedent going forward so once he returns something, well, maybe there will be more claims like this. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's one of the one of the explanations. And then uh, I think uh, from the more legalistic perspective, they don't appreciate the moral uh, arguments that I brought forward. That the law, as it stands right now cannot simply uh, pretend that something had not happened in the past. They are all, you know, cozy bureaucrats doing their daily work routine, etc., etc. And all of a sudden comes this young lawyer waving the Constitution, brandishing this kind of high moral grounds uh, for, for the return of those, uh, those papers. And they were lost. They didn't know what to do. Uh, and that is, that is exactly what happened during my fir first phone conversation with the archives. Counselor, we have no idea what to do. So that's why they've been stonewalling me for uh, months. And then I was very surprised that the same path was followed by the Minister of Culture. Because the Minister of Culture is the supervisor body over the archives. So he should have, he should have returned the literary state once I notified him of, of this fact, and I complained to him about the stubbornness of the archives, they didn't care. 
they didn't care. And that, that why, I think after two years of uh, this uh, going back and forth, I was close to quit. But then uh, my grandma passed away, and all this, all this family stuff happened. And uh, I, I thought about this and I said, no, what about my credibility in front of my students? How can, how can I teach them about the dignity as a principle of EU law if I cannot win this case? So for me, it was a very, very, very difficult, uh, very difficult and at the same time important decision from the perspective of my professional life as well. If I can't win, what's the point in writing books, articles, teaching, if this elementary justice is missing? On phone three, trust me. <laughs> but I will, I will, I will keep pushing. Yes. I'm wondering, do you feel the Constitution is under threat now with the new government? Wow, that's that's a question. Uh, I wrote some pieces in English on that, and definitely yes, it is under threat because they, they, I mean, I'm pretty sure that if uh, the current government was a was at the was at power when the case uh, 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 was uh, making its way through the courts, that would be much much more difficult because of this narrative. Uh, we against the world. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, Kaczynski's uh, motto: be anti everything, anti Russia, anti Germany, anti EU. Uh, because Poland Poland uh, should be owed by the EU for the past misdeeds on the part of Europe. We've been forgotten, we've been, uh, we've been betrayed, and this is the time for Europe to pay us back. This is unfortunately the narrative that shapes the government's policy right now. Uh, so the constitution is under threat. The Polish constitutional court is gone. It has been dismantled. So uh, more to come, unfortunately. That's why I'm so afraid to be going back uh, home in, uh, in June. <laughs> But, uh, but Poland needs me, I know, I know that. It's like catch-22. On the one hand, you want to stay, but on the other hand, you know that uh, I should be there. I should be there. That's my temper. Yes? I'm reading here, um, it said in the October when the judge of the district court sent a warrant to the uh, archives, the head of the archives. I'm trying to figure out where the papers were. The head of archives, I think, is in Warsaw, but then it says the warrant was implemented because he says the papers, the materials are actually in Milanovic. Milan yeah, where is Milanovic? Milanovic is a uh, tiny, tiny town north of Warsaw. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, 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 the, the, the judge idea was, uh, since it, it is in the archives, it's not my responsibility to decide on, 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 on the literary state, because it's not within my power, uh, it's within the administrative courts to decide whether they should return it or not. And I brought one of the many cases, and one of, of the many legal avenues that I explored in this case, was to bring the case before the uh, administrative court in Warsaw. Because I was running out of options, and then when the Eureka moment came, and I finally got what I wanted, I had to uh, extinguish all those other cases, because I was all over the place. Uh, Polish Ombudsman, Administrative Court, uh, uh, Minister of Culture, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, trust me, 2,000 pages that the forward uh, mentions, uh, it is true. And when I when I started uh, getting ready for this uh, for this talk, uh, I opened my computer with the folders, and I got lost because there are so, there are so many of documents, uh, PDFs, articles, uh, pleadings, uh, uh, articles from the Polish press. Uh, it took me some time to find my bearings around the material. Yes. Were you recognized in Poland for this? Did you get some kind of recognition? Yeah, or oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, that's that's uh, the fun part of the story because uh, even in the you know in the darkest of times during this case, the media was always on my side. So when I was uh, close to quitting, 
Uh, there were articles published in uh, uh, Polish Daily Gazeta Wyborcza, Polish Weekly Politica, strongly condemning the, uh, the, the court's uh, approaches. And this is something that really helped me because I, you know, I'm well aware how powerful press could be. So every time I pleaded the case in front of uh, one more judge, I showed him, look, look, you are looked at, you are watched. This is not just another case. Have a look, read, read. Because I will go to press. You know, I realized I have to, I had to play hardball with them as well. So if you read Polish, let me know. I will, I will send you those articles. They are absolutely uh, stunning. And you know, the, the, the very important part now, looking back, is with those articles, uh, based on the final archives, based on uh, the interviews uh, with uh, the family and with me. Uh, it's really, uh, the, the case has been given a new twist. So Naftali Hertz Khan was reborn all of a sudden. Uh, there was a growing interest. Wow, his poetry is beautiful. Where could I read it? And that's the ultimate satisfaction, to give back the face to a person who's been forgotten for the last 45 years. This is absolutely precious. Oh, one more, yes. Is this case um, specific to this poet, or is it a general decision by the court that can be used by other people? Uh, there is no precedent in Poland, Polish legal system, but uh, there are some uh, general points, general uh, ideas that you can draw from this case for future cases. And you know, as far as restitution notification is concerned, people ask me, how did you do it? And you know the answer is uh, uh, straightforward. You have to combine three elements: persistence, good legal strategy, and a bit of luck. <laughs> and they must all come together. And I and I had all three. But as I uh, uh, as, as as the article in Forward mentions, this huge this case could have huge, huge ramifications uh, moving forward because it sets a precedent. Hey, look, in Poland, they return the literary state. So if they return literary state, why shouldn't we use the courts in order to get our property back? Uh, buildings, <coughs> factors. Persistence, good legal strategy, and a bit of luck. And uh, as all presenters in this series, you get your own copy of the Canvas catalog, which we call, and it will be a way to keep you engaged with us if you go back and face. <laughs>